Good morning. Hey. Well, welcome. Good to see you again. And uh, it's our second session using uh, a verse in 2 Corinthians to springboard off from. And uh, someone told me it was going to be really hot today, so I put on my coolest Californian vineyard shirt. Uh, and I realized that others hadn't quite followed suit. And very warm here doesn't necessarily equate to very warm. <laughs> but uh, I hope you like my shirt anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yesterday, uh, I met a, a young lady uh, after the first morning session. And she said that she thought I looked like Tom Hanks channeling Father Christmas on his summer holidays. So I, I don't even know what to make of that. I think I'll just share that with you. Um, If you've got a Bible, please turn to 1 Corinthians 1. If you haven't, they do sell them here, and I do encourage you. <clears throat> Every year at New Wine, the, uh, the, the, the people running the bookstore ask me, New Wine's a big conference we run in England, and uh, they ask me if I'm going to plug the Bible again. I say, of course, that's what I do. And uh, every year they stock up with sort of crate loads of study Bibles, and I love it. We, I sell more of those than I do of my books, and I'm very thrilled to do that, of course. Um, Bible's wonderful. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to read three little passages together, and uh, then we'll pray, and then we'll tuck in. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 20. You'll know these passages well. St. Paul writes, verse 20, Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Then let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, very familiar passage to you. And uh, let's read from verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance, the most important, number one importance, what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas then to the twelve. And then one more, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 to 4. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. But I'm afraid that even as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached or you receive a different spirit which you have not received or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you put up with this. Well, Lord, we pray that in these next 50 minutes or so together, 
that you would speak to us, Lord. In, through, or regardless of anything I say, uh, will you speak? And Lord, we are sat or stood here in the presence of your cross. We want to love it. and We want to live with it, Lord. We want to live before it and live from it. We want to be people who are marked by the cross. We want to plumb its riches and its depths. We want to apply its benefits to our lives. Lord, we want to hold on to it today. And we pray even today that you would realign us, Lord, with the cross. Realign us with it, Lord. And we bless you. We ask you, Lord, to come and help us. Amen. So you'll know that St. Paul, writing to the Corinthians, is writing to a church that he founded, but a church that uh, has deviated again and again from the gospel on which he founded it. The church is founded and grounded on the gospel. The church is founded and grounded on Christ crucified and Christ risen. And yet this church in Corinthians, they are all the while being evangelized by culture. And all the while they're being sort of drawn away from the main and the plain, as John Wimber used to say. The main and the plain of the gospel and repentance and faith in Christ. All the while, things are itching their ears and they're drawn away by abstractions. This, this thing over here in some temple cult, this thing over here in the flesh, these preachers who've turned up, who appear to be dynamic and charismatic and have power and eloquence and ooh, let's follow them. It's a church that is just really into the latest thing, the latest fad, the latest trend in the, in the church. And Paul, when he hears about this, he's grieved in his spirit because he says, you have left what I gave you. You've left that place that is supposed to secure you, the cross of Christ. And so there are numerous themes throughout Corinthians, but in both letters, it seems that the church has still got this same underlying problem. They think they can graduate from the gospel, and they can't. And he's constantly calling them back to basics, back to the beginning, as that poem from T.S. Eliot talked about, after all our journeyings, we come back to where we began, to know that place again, as for the first time. We've got to keep coming back. The great theologian Karl Barth often used to say, begin again at the beginning. We've got to begin again at the beginning. We begin again at the beginning. I love that you've got a cross here. I do so many conferences. You never see a cross. You never see a symbol of the faith. I love that. They're strong and proud and prominent and humbling for us. That's what it's all about. Have you spent any time there lately? The first thing I want to say today, and this is more a kind of prophetic word than it is an ex exegesis, We're gospel people or we are irrelevant. We're gospel people or we're irrelevant. About 18 months ago, I was invited by, um, I was very honored to do so, by a, a, a Christian newspaper in our country to write an article, a letter. And, it, and they were doing a series every few months on a letter to the church in England. And what a wonderful thing to be invited to do that. And I prayed a lot about it and, and sought God and wanted to reflect in this letter what I'd felt as a burden over the years. And so I wrote an article and it was called simply this, Drop the Cross, Lose the Plot. Drop the Cross, Lose the Plot. If you drop the cross, you lose the plot. You forget what, what you're for. 
You forget why you're here. You forget what you're about. We lose sight of where we came from and where we're going and how we're to get there. If we drop the cross, we lose the plot. The thought actually came to me as I was walking into work. I'd set aside the morning to write this article and I walked into work and I walked a route that I knew very well and I, as I was walking over the bridge, I saw a blue plaque. Some of you who have been to England know that sometimes uh, in England where there were historic sites or sites of, of, work, of note, they put a kind of blue kind of plaque, a metal one an enamel one that says someone famous lived here or something famous happened here. And it was on a bridge and there was a plaque and it said that something uh, wonderful had once grown there and it had, been, it had died. And I thought, what a very funny thing to have a plaque. I'd never seen this before. Here, it was a plaque saying here was something special that is no more. And as I looked at it, I felt God say to me, the church is in danger of becoming simply a place where there is a historical plaque. The church was once here. Once upon a time, something called the church lived here. There were people called Christians. Here, amazing, really. Ooh, go and consult your history books. And as I was looking at that and sensing the Lord talk to me and sensing this was what I should write the article on, my, my phone buzzed. I took it out at the very same moment. I took it out and it was a text message from one of my colleagues. And my colleagues said to me, I'm at a church growth conference and I'm leading the worship. And during the worship, the six foot cross hanging over the platform hit the floor, but no one noticed. I thought, oh, what? So I texted him back. I said, what do you mean? What's going on here? He said, Seriously, man, I'm leading worship. The six-foot neon plastic green cross hit the floor, but everyone had their eyes closed, their hands in the air, and no one noticed they were completely oblivious to the fact that the cross had fallen down. They just kept on going. They dropped the cross, but they were still pushing in and singing their songs and having a right old time, but the cross had dropped. No one rushed to pick it up. They didn't even know. And he just thought this was amusing. But I wondered if it wasn't prophetic. And here at a, a wonderful, wonderful group of people they were in, church growth conference, looking at how to grow the church. They dropped the cross and they missed it. This is, this is the only thing we've got to live by. The only thing we've got to, this is the only thing that we've got to offer the world, really, it's what flows from this. There is nothing that the world can't offer itself that we can offer apart from the cross. All our best service, all our best ministry, all our best social action, and we've got to be the best on the block. We should be the most motivated in those things. And last night was completely epic. I was totally humbled and in awe of that wonderful ministry. But actually, the world can offer all of that. But it can't offer this. That's the one thing that is unique to us. We offer Christ and him crucified. And if we drop the cross, we lose the plot. Some of you will remember back to 1990 and the vineyard had done a conference in Sydney in Australia. And it didn't go very well. I mean, those who attended, who wanted to attend, enjoyed it. And God was there. Jack Deere was there. John Wimber was there. And uh, it was a good conference. However, there was a real pushback from some of the conservatives, some of those uh, from the sort of Sydney um, conservative evangelical theological tradition. And afterwards, they wrote a book against Wimber. Did any of you ever read that? It was called The Briefing. No? It's old news, really, but I read it. Um, and uh, basically, these conservative theologians wrote a book called The Briefing against the vineyard, against John Wimber and against their visit. And they went through the whole thing, what happened, who preached, what was said, etc., 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 and they just repeatedly criticized and under my, and sort of cut the legs from under the vineyard ministry. It was a painful read. 
And many wanted to just stand up and protest. You know, I felt like protesting against this thing. Jack Deere wrote this. John Wimber was ashamed before the Lord. And he was embarrassed before the men who had written the document and pointed it out. One of the criticisms was that not one of their songs mentioned the cross. That they didn't preach on the cross. That the cross was not prominent in their songs or their sermons. And they pointed this, this out. When Wimber returned home, he gathered all the writers of Vineyard Music and he confessed to them that he had been remiss in not stressing the cross enough to our writers. He asked all of them to begin concentrating on the cross in their work and their meditation and to begin reading and rereading the classic texts on the cross and he made it clear that it was his desire to see the vineyard reach a new depth of worship music in reference to the cross. 27 years ago, that's a generation and we've got to begin again at the beginning. And every new generation needs to be shown that the way in is the way on. And it's the cross and it's the gospel. I'm just going to repeat myself about 50 times until about 10 to 12 this morning, okay? We never graduate from the gospel. A while ago I was at a vineyard conference and uh, I was being interviewed by the lovely James Rankin, a mate of mine. And we, were just, uh, uh, and we were just talking about various stuff in this interview. And he said, do conservative evangelicals preach the cross too often? Do they talk about the gospel too much? Surely we should talk about the kingdom. We, you know, we've got to move on and have some debt. And that was his question. It was a sincere question. It was a good question. It's an important question. But that was it. Do they talk about the gospel too much? I said to him, James... They don't talk about it enough. They don't talk about it enough. Every sermon should be crammed with Christ. And you can't talk about Christ without talking about who he is and what he did. And we can't talk about that unless we talk about this because this is the heart of it all. It's not all of it, but it's the heart of it. We're people of the cross. Drop the cross, lose the plot, lose the story. Lose the point. Lose the grand narrative. This morning I listened to a little video of a guy who was the head of the World Council of Churches until last year called Dr. And forgive me, I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Olav Fiske. Fixer. F-Y-K-S-E. Norwegian. Fixer. I was trying to find a sort of culturally relevant Scandinavian quote. This is one. From Dr. Olav Fixer Tavai. He said this, the cross is our reality check. That's a good line. It's our reality check. Everything we sing, everything we say, everything we do, everything we pray, we must filter through the cross. It's our reality check. Luther, the father of the Reformation, 500 years ago this October, said crux probat omnia, the cross tests everything. We apply the cross to everything. What has the cross got to say to our pastoral work? What has the cross got to say to our ethics? What has the cross got to say to our worship? What has the cross got to say to our children's work? What has the cross got to say to our mission? What has the cross got to say to our mercy ministry? What has the cross got to say? It is the motif, it is the template we apply to everything. We're a cross-shaped people or we're not Christian. Drop the cross, lose the plot. I was invited to speak at a church, a well-known church. I'm not sure they'll ever invite me back, but I was invited there. And uh, it was a church with a great reputation. Uh, I flew into the country. I was really nervous and excited for weeks. It was an amazing church. And when I got there, I was surprised that it, a church that had once had 5,000 people now had 500. I thought, I wonder why. What happened? 
churches go through seasons, and being large doesn't mean to say you're right or good or whatever. It just means to say you're offering something that those particular people like eating. But I wondered. At three o'clock that night, I woke up wide awake. It wasn't jet lag, I was just awake. And again, I felt the Lord speak to me. He doesn't often talk to me, but he was talking to me. And, and I got out of bed and I went into the room and I just said, Lord, what is it you want to say to me? And he said, I want you tomorrow to preach the cross. I thought, oh, no. No, I, I've got some really good sermons. I can, I can make them laugh. We'll make them cry. We'll have a great time. Everyone will feel their heart strangely warmed. It'll be cathartic and moving. It'll be brilliant. And everyone will say, wasn't it wonderful having Simon from Oxford here? And I'll go home a happy man thanking God that I had a really good time. And God said, no, I want you to preach the cross. I thought, it's just old school. So, I don't know. I, I, I felt nervous. I felt I'd embarrass myself that at this famous church. Anyway, I, I preached. In the end, you know, you've got to obey God, so I did what he told me. I preached, and I felt a strange freedom. I felt an anointing. And I, I just reveled in the love of God poured out to me in the blood of Christ and his great work of redemption reaching out through time and space to reconcile the universe to himself from his arms outstretched. I loved it. I preached the cross, and afterwards I sat down. One of the pastors came up to me and just looked at me, and I wanted him to say, wow, awesome, you know. Because <laughs> honestly, I'm so sinful. I'm so full of my flesh. I'm so insecure, you know. <laughs> That's what I wanted him to I just, you know... And I'd say, no, not really, but not bad. And <laughs> do you know what he said? He just said to me, well, that was simple. And I just, I just whoa. I just felt a shock. I, I thought, yeah, it was simple. But, I mean, that's the point. You don't have to be a brain surgeon to understand the gospel. Do you know what I mean? And anyone far off can come near. You don't have to have gone to Oxford or Tübingen or Basel or, you know, the Sorbonne to understand this. This is for everyone. That was simple, but it hurt me, and I thought, there's something wrong. It was simple, but that's the point. And then another pastor, an old retired pastor, came over, and he was weeping. And he shook my hand, and he, he said, you reminded me of the person who'd been the pastor there years before when the church took off. He, he said this, he loved to preach the gospel and to call people to follow Jesus. God, was, God spoke to me. I saw something. I wondered if this was indicative that the reason why that the, the church, it was a good church, God bless them, but the reason why the church was in decline, the reason why the church was not what it once was, was because they'd moved on to higher things. They'd graduated from the gospel. It's just too simple, this. A bit simple, that. Not cool enough, not trendy enough, not contemporary enough, not relevant enough, not when... This is always all of that. But so often we can get abstracted and move away. That's what happened in Corinthians. And it happened right in, and that's why he wrote his first letter. But a few years later, it's still the same. So he writes a second letter to say, Oi, oi, get back to the gospel. Don't go listening to all of this stuff. Get back to the gospel. That's the first point, although it was a few points, but it was the same point. Here's another one. Secondly, the gospel is always being attacked. It's always being attacked. It's always being abandoned. Why? Well, fundamentally, because the world, the flesh, and the devil protest. The world, the flesh, and the devil hate the cross. Because the cross exposes them for what they are. The cross reveals the source of them and reveals the destiny of them, that they are short-lived. They've got very little time, just this time, until the Lord comes and then the world, the flesh, and the devil will all be consumed in the fire. 
And so the world, the flesh and the devil, they hate this. They protest against the cross. They rage against the cross. It offends them. It undermines them. It challenges them. It provokes them. And they don't want anything to do with it. They don't mind us being religious. They don't mind us being spiritual. They don't mind us doing good works because they can all get off on that in some way, but they do object to the cross. They do object to that which nails them. So many of the New Testament letters deal with uh, Paul is writing to churches in trouble. Peter's writing to a church in trouble. Jude is writing to a church in trouble. And they're in trouble because they've left the gospel. And they've brought back into, they've either gone backwards or sideways, buying into a culture. Not the veneer, not the externals of it, but fundamentally their values are being shaped not by the crucified God, but being shaped by the things of this world. And this world doesn't like the crucified God. The Corinthians focused on charismatic superpowers and super apostles. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? The Colossians were hooked on esoteric New Age spirituality. Spirituality and angels and special food, and special days, and special things like that. All of, none of which are wrong in and of themselves, except you put them all together and push them in the place of the cross, and then you've gone really wrong. The Galatians, well, they they got the gospel, but they thought there was a bit more, and the more was to be had by being religious, by being legalistic by form and ceremony and outward sign. And in particular, they can impress God by circumcision. And so the men were all getting circumcised so they could really be in with God. And in all of them, in all those letters, when Paul writes, he says to them, no way, no way, man. He doesn't quite say it like that, but this is, you know, 21st century. He says, not a chance. You do not graduate from the gospel. You don't get back to the cross. The cross puts everything in perspective. Do I impress God by my wisdom, my learning, and my religion back to the cross? No, you don't. Am I to be impressed by superstars with anointed gifts who would just take the center stage, who take the platform, who show off and show up all the stuff that they can do? No, because we go back to the cross, and there we see the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God, the foolishness, that's the wisdom of God and it's foolishness to man, but it is the power of God as well. God's power is made perfect in weakness, not in what we do, but in what he has done. I believe two main problems beset the gospel ministry in the church today. And they're very simple. The first is is gospel plus, we add to it. And the second is gospel minus, we take away from it. Very simple, it's just basic maths. Gospel Plus is a kind of special edition Christianity for the real keenies, for the in crowd, for the Illuminati, for the particularly anointed. And Gospel Minus is where we undermine the gospel to fit in with culture. Let's just look at these. Gospel Plus, where we add a spirituality or a theology that we think we can improve on the cross. We we haven't abandoned the cross. We don't reject the cross. We just think we we need to add, there's a bit more to it than that. You know, we're on to higher things. Some of you will know David Parker. All my illustrations today are vineyard ones, because it's vineyard. You know David Parker, Desert Vineyard, what a wonderful man. He, back in the 80s, uh, I remember meeting him then, traveled, into, traveled widely with the prophets. You remember the Kansas prophets? Anyone remember any of them? A few of you. This is old vineyard stories. There was a, there was a period in the church when, 
Wimber wanted to open the doors to the prophetic and, and renew that very important gift in the church. And we need to be a prophetic people. We need to be listening to God. And these are, I would that all God's people were prophets. Prophecy, prophecy, it matters. Let's have a seminar later on it. But he opened the door to the prophetic and other things seemed to get sidelined. And the prophetic seemed to get a bit weird. And what it actually did was it, it tended to focus on individuals. So it was based upon a kind of word of knowledge, and I believe in all these things, a word of knowledge model. People have amazing no words, and they'd call people out, and that one person in 5,000 would be really blessed. After several years, Dave Parker suddenly had his eyes opened. He said, hang on a sec. I have attended meetings for the last four or five years, hundreds and hundreds of meetings. The Lord has been there. The saints have been encouraged. We've had wonderful worship. We've seen amazing revelatory gifts displayed. It's been a really amazing time. But I haven't seen anyone become a Christian. Like not one. And Parker was just, he just suddenly, his eyes opened. He went, hang on a sec. No one's got saved. We've been really charismatic and really anointed and really powerful and really moving in the prophetic and I haven't seen anyone get saved. He didn't become cynical. He just thought we've got the balance wrong. The pendulum has swung. We've got we to gotta bring it back. And a job came up. Dear Brent Rue passed away and David Parker went to be the pastor at Lancaster Vineyard. That church at the time was going through a real charismatic excess. The pastor had been ill for a while and it was a bit like things were not good. In fact, Rich Nathan, you know Rich Nathan? Columbus, Ohio Vineyard, wonderful man. He said, the church had become a religious, this is a quote, a religious country club for members who saw ever more exotic religious experiences. Parker gets there and he says, what are we going to do? It's just a small church, 100 people. I mean, that's the last church in England, but in America it's not. And uh, he just, the Lord said, just do something. So, and he just brought it back to teaching. He had a wonderful teaching gift. He just said, we're going to bring it back to basics. We're going to begin again at the beginning. We're going to build ourselves around the gospel. And he's an evangelist, a Bible teacher, started preaching scripture, teaching the faith, doing evangelism. The church grew to what? I don't know, 7,000, something like that? Amazing, thousands. N numerous sites. It just took off. Why? Because all of those wonderful religious experiences were nice for those who were having them, but not for anyone else. But this, that's the best experience. Forgiveness and freedom, and deliverance, and wholeness, and cleansing, and purity, and anointing, and heaven touching. Where does heaven touch earth? There. Where does heaven touch earth? Right there. At the cross. The cross. And God mediated through the preaching of the cross, the preaching of the gospel, reached out, and people were saved, and a community was transformed. There are some crazy things out there. I'm not wanting to stand here 12 foot above contradiction. Look at my shirt, I'm crazy, man. But I can't find a verse in the Bible that says I can't wear it. But we've got to be really careful, saints. We've got to be careful. This is the lesson of scripture and, and church history, one of them, that so often God's people are led astray. They're, they're good people, and for all the right reasons, they're led astray, but they're led astray by false winds, false doctrines, false spirits. What Paul in 2 Corinthians says is another Jesus and another spirit and another gospel. It's another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. How do we know we've got the right one? We bring it back to the cross. We have put the template on it and we say, how well does this fit that? Under scripture at the foot of the cross. 
David Ruiz came to stay with me a while ago. You know the rooster? You know little David Ruiz? He, said, he came to stay with me and he said, I don't, he just said in his way, dude, it's crazy out there. I said, what's crazy, man? He said, he'd just been at a conference in Holland and Holland is not a place known for being crazy. And uh, he'd just been at this conference in Holland and there'd been these apostles who were saying that, and they'd come from Canada, that God had sent them there and they were the God-appointed apostles of Holland, like the church hadn't been there for a while, but they were now the appointed apostles and that people needed to align correctly with them and if they didn't, the the heavens would open and darkness would fall. I mean, is that bonkers or what? Seriously, the rooster told me this. I said, mate, that is crazy. Who are they? He said, they're just some, you know, people who think they're apostles called by God. You know, one of them, you know, their grandparent came from Holland or something and they've gone there. They're the apostles to Holland. You need to align with them rightly. Otherwise, people are going to get sick. But if you align with them rightly, blessing will come. Is that mad? That is Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians, the apostles turned up and said, We know Paul planted this, but there's a new kid on the block, and you align with us rightly. It actually says they were punching people. I mean, seriously, man. I said to David Ruiz, dude, that is crazy out there, man. One famous Pentecostal minister I heard a while ago said he had this conversation with God. God isn't it all about getting people to believe in Jesus? And God said to him, you've got to get people believing in the angel because the people already believe in Jesus. Like, what? Are you mad? Now listen, saints, I'm aware this might sound all a bit odd. You think, what's what's he talking about? As I've gone around and as I've looked at the church, this is my burden. Yesterday morning, we've lost the Bible. Yesterday, later morning, I feel we've lost the fear of the Lord. Today, I'm telling you, I think we've just lost touch with reality sometimes. And we've lost the cross. And it's back to the gospel or it's back to the jungle. We've got to hold on to the cross. It's not just a matter of evil, totalitarian, antichrist systems coming against us. I mean, there are those, but actually from within the church, there is dilution and there is deviation. I want everything that God has got for me. I want, there is more, I wrote a book called More. There is more of the spirit. I spent a decade teaching that. There is more but we need the more of God on the basis of what God has revealed in Scripture. This is perfect, and it tells us who he is, what he's like, and how he works. And if the more doesn't lead me back to the cross in gratitude, if it doesn't fill my heart with love and bend my knees and moisten my eyes before the cross, then something's wrong. One of the most influential charismatic leaders in recent years talking about feathers as a sign of God's presence of the angels. Angels don't have feathers, not one of them. But there are billions of birds that molt and so you will see lots of feathers. He said, God wants to take us farther and we can only get there by following these signs. Our present understanding of scripture can only take us so far. So what, the feathers are going to take us there? Guys, we've got to, oh, back to the Bible. What, what does the Bible say? Let me test that in the word of God. Let me test that. That's not being judgmental. That's not being critical. That is being spiritual. That is being mature. The other pressure that comes upon the church uh, is as an accommodation to culture. 
And we buy into these things, guys. You know, a vet, a friend of mine is a vet in Northern Ireland. He sent me an email about three months ago. He had trained up another young vet who had just gone to Scotland and opened up his own practice. And the other vet had sent him an email of what had happened that day. He said a couple came in and they just bought two new Alsatian dogs, puppies. Alsatian, do you know Alsatian puppies? No? German shepherds. German shepherd, big. He brought them in. They were eight weeks old, apparently, and they were coming for their first vaccination. So he looked at them and had a check, and he came back out. This is true. All my stories are true. <laughs> This is true. And he says, to them, he says to the couple, he said, where did you get these? They said, well, we responded to an advert in the newspaper and we went and, or in, in the shop and we went and picked them up at the supermarket car park and the man sold them to us at the back of the car. He said, how much did you pay for them? He said, 200 pounds each, which was a lot, but not as much as they would have been. He said, but they don't have papers. They're, but, you know, two Alsatian pups. So the vet says, these are not Alsatian pups. They went, oh, you're kidding me. They're not Alsatian pups. He says, they're not puppies. They're guinea pigs. <laughs> guinea pigs. Now, now, guinea pig, I went online to look at Alsatian puppies and guinea pigs. <laughs> and you think, no. No, an Alsatian pup doesn't look like a guinea pig. But if you've never had dogs, then even then, how are you taken in by that? That is true. That is an email that I was sent, and it's true. What? Are you kidding me, Alsatian pup? No, it's a guinea pig. I mean, the point is obvious. Sometimes in the church... And we who are charismatics are the worst and the most gullible because we want the spirit. We want what God is doing. We want more of him. We want his anointing. We want his gifting. We want to be led by him. Behold, he does a new thing. I'm up for it now. Sometimes we're taken in and it's more guinea pig than it is Alsatian. The other problem, as I've said, is cultural accommodation. That's bowing to the zeitgeist. It's bowing to the spirit of this age. It's another gospel. It's another Jesus. It's another spirit. And you know when this is at work because it's when the church is expected to conform to the values, ethics, morals, and decrees of society. It's when we compromise on how we've lived and what we've understood for two millennia according to the plain reading of Scripture just so that it fits in with culture. I came across this quote from a bishop in the Episcopalian Church in America who said, Salvation lies in attending to the needs of others. And they said that, this is a bishop, the greatest heresy in the Western church is to believe that Jesus is the only way to God. I thought that's what we believed. I thought when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me, that's what he meant. I thought that's what he meant. I, I thought that when he said that, when he dies for us, that he opens his heart and opens his arms and opens heaven and opens eternity and opens the book of life for us, that that's what was happening. I didn't realize that he was one amongst many. But leaders in the church are leading the church astray. And we've got to keep coming back to basics, back to the Bible, back to the gospel, back to Calvary and say, Lord, is this that? We need to be aware of the pressure of culture. There's more I could wanted to say on that, but time is running away. 
the cross is under attack. The cross is under attack. It's under attack from outside the church and it's under attack from inside the church. You know, Nietzsche, German philosopher, Nietzsche is what I call him, but Nietzsche, he hated the cross. He used to sign his letters Dionysus or Bacchus against the crucified. I mean, imagine saying, it's not yours sincerely. (laughs) Uh, Have a good day. God bless you faithfully. Dionysus against the crucified one. He said about the cross, the crucifix, he said, God is a spider on a wall. He hated the cross. And he was really demonized. And he opened a porthole of darkness. I tell you, that ushered forth in Nazism. He was the great ideologue of that. But in the church today, I am hearing Christians say almost the same thing. Church leaders who are attacking the cross, who are attacking the blood, who are saying almost blasphemous things. They have, you know, the Bible puts forward many metaphors of atonement. You know, the battle metaphor and the justice metaphor and the penal substitutionary metaphor. They're all in there, the sacrificial lamb and so on. But today there seems to be a thing in the church where in the church people sound like Nietzsche. And in the church they are attacking the cross. What sort of a God would kill his son? Well, that is a false presentation of what the gospel says anyway. They set up a straw house and then knock it down. But in what they are doing is walking heavily through the blood. We've got to defend the cross We've got to stand up for the cross. We've got to live before the cross. We've got to hold onto the cross. Paul says in his letter that the cross is the wisdom of God, but the foolish is foolishness to man. He says in his letter of 1 Corinthians that they needed to remember that which was of first importance, that he died for our sins. And that means there was a substitution. He died for me in my place. And there was a sacrifice. He died. It is substitutionary and it is sacrificial. And in 2 Corinthians, we read that the church there had gone after a different Jesus with a different gospel that mediated a different spirit. The test, what holds us, what moors us, what anchors us in place is the cross of Christ. And we need to celebrate it. We need to meditate on it. We need to bring our lives before it. We need to apply it to our lives. We've got to be people of the cross. We've got to study. That's what Wimber said. We're going to study the books. We're going to study the text. We're going to start singing and we're going to start celebrating this again. Wimber was, was humbled and broken because he realized they'd lost the cross somewhere along the line and just become consumerist and we needed to get back to the gospel. And that was 27 years ago and we need to kick. Every generation needs to come back to that place. Karl Barth begin again at the beginning. I'm going to finish with this. Thank you for being so patient with this unusual message. Last summer, we said goodbye to a a Nigerian priest who had been on sabbatical in Oxford and at our church. I, I didn't even know he was in our church. I didn't even, you know, we have lots of visitors and Hey, you know, believe it or not, I'm an introvert. I don't find it easy talking to people and strangers. I just sort of sit at the front and hide. And, and the new, I'm a rubbish pastor. And um, we, we had this guy, and he was in our church. I had seen him. I'd never spoken to him. And on the last day, before he flew out, one on the team, uh, Charlie, invited him, the rector, to say, he said, would you like to say something? 
Come, come on up. Thank you for being with us and having a sabbatical here. We're sorry we didn't have, let you have any, uh, the pulpit or anything like that. Is there anything you'd like to say? This humble uh, African, Ni- northern Nigerian priest. And he just stood there meekly. And he told us his story. He said, you know, we're really suffering. Our people are dying. Members of my family have been killed. My friends have been killed by radical extremists up there, Boko Haram. He says that my car has been blown up and uh, you know, death threats made. It's a, it's a difficult time to be a Christian where we are. So what did he want? Did he want a, did he want a visa so he could come and live for in England? <laughs> no. He just asked us to pray for him. And then he said this. Char- Charlie's again might said, "Do you have okay? Thanks very much for that. Um, do you have a word for us?" And he looked at our congregation, and he said this: "Do not compromise in the West on the gospel that we are dying for in Africa." Do not compromise in the West on the gospel that we're dying for. Those Coptic Christians that we heard about last night in that remarkable musical and dramatic presentation, those Coptic Christians, you know, every one of them had a tattoo. Because to be a Copt, you are tattooed at baptism with a cross on your wrist. Every one of them died with a cross on their wrist and a cross in their heart. They died for the cross and their faith in the cross. And because of that cross, they went instantly into eternal glory. We're we're the cross people. We're the gospel people. Our people are not dying for silliness. They're not dying for the latest thing. They're not dying for feathers. They're dying for the Father's love and the Son's sacrifice and the Word of God that shapes their life and the promise of eternal life with Him. That's what, that's what it's about. Do not compromise in the West on the gospel that we're dying for in Africa. Amen? Let's stand and uh, let's pray. And thank you for listening to me. I share my heart with you this morning. Lord, these are strong things. And Lord, I know I can end up saying stuff that's from me and not from you and out of my stomach. But Lord, I pray that you'd make us a gospel people. We pray you'd make us a cross-shaped people. We pray, Lord, that we would be people who hold faithfully to the cross, that we would never seek to graduate from it, Lord, that we would live there and love it and hold on to it and hold it out. We pray that you'd brand it on our souls, Lord, that it, we'd celebrate it and sing of it and meditate on it and love it, Lord. We pray you'd forgive us when so easily we have moved on and looked for the new. Lord, we want you. We want everything that you've got to offer us and we come to the cross for it, Lord. We pray, Lord, that in our own lives we would enjoy the benefits of the cross. We pray this for our families, our communities. Pray for our churches, Lord, that they might herald the cross that they might herald the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We pray, Lord, that you'd make us faithful to you. Don't let us drop this, Lord. Don't let us drop the cross and lose the plot. And we pray for your church where she is being, uh, she is under pressure from outside cultural exigencies or spiritual forces that are offering a different gospel and a different Jesus and a different spirit. And we pray, Lord, that you'd bless her and help her to see it and keep your church faithful and pure, Lord. 
And we bless you, Lord. Amen. Well, thanks, saints. See you tomorrow.